So what do President Ronald Reagan and Hillary Clinton have in common? Ronald Reagan was the President of the United States in the 1980s and represented the Republican Party. And Hillary Clinton was the 2016 Democratic presidential candidate. So does anyone know what they have in common? Any guesses? Any ideas? Silence? <laughs> no, they, they might have, possibly, I'm not sure. That wasn't what I've got on my paper here, but well, that's, very, that's a very detailed answer there. I don't know. Yeah. Um, well, I'm oh, sorry, they were in the, well, sort of, they're in the White House in different capacities. They probably walked in the same corridors in the White House, yep, they're probably, walked, they're both American, yep, that's probably, so they're both in common, yeah, that's right, they're both humans, so, um, but, well, the thing that, the thing that they have in common is that they actually both changed political sides. A, pre, a, pre, a Republican President, Ronald Reagan, used to identify as a Democrat, and Hillary Clinton, former Democratic presidential candidate, was at one stage a Republican. They changed their party of allegiance. They changed their minds. And some, perhaps more cynical amongst us, would say that it's relatively common for politicians to change their minds. In fact, I found an internet search online which talked about, what do you call someone who changes their mind a lot? And the answers provided were fickle, double-minded, wishy-washy, a politician. Polit <laughs> I didn't say anything. Well, politicians often change their minds. And another, another politician who changed their mind was another, another American, George Wallace. Now, Wallace was the governor of Alabama in the south of the United States. And in the 1960s, he was at the heart and the height of the American civil rights movement. And Wallace passionately opposed desegregation of the races and represented racial hatred. In his inauguration address in 1963, he announced that he stood for segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. Yet, he changed. He, later in his career, he changed his mind on segregation, integration and equal rights. So that in his later years, he was championing black voting rights. He appointed black officials to state offices in his, in his final term of governor. And at his funeral in 1998, an estimated 25,000 mourners, nearly as many blacks as whites, walked past his coffin, quietly reverent. George Wallace changed. So what would cause someone to change their mind so dramatically? Politicians, in fact, all people, change their minds for a variety of reasons. Politicians often change their minds to be popular, to reflect public opinion. Maybe that's why they're often regarded as, as wishy-washy. But changing your mind over more deeply held convictions is more difficult and much rarer. That's why it's not very common for people like Ronald Reagan, Hillary Clinton and George Wallace to change their minds over party allegiances or deeply held beliefs like segregation, for example. And today we travel to the ancient land of Syria where we encounter a story of change. We see a story of someone whose mind was changed, indeed his whole life was radically transformed. In fact, this story today is perhaps one of the greatest changes of mind in all of history. Far more than simply changing political allegiances, political policies, or even changing your minds over civil rights issues, we meet a person who changed their mind over fundamental questions of reality, truth, and human flourishing. We meet a man deeply opposed to a new religious movement, a man deeply invested in its extermination. Yet he changed. And this change dramatically affected the world. How did this happen? What does this change mean? What changed in Syria? Well, let's look at Acts chapter 9 and find out. 
And the events of Acts chapter 9 follow the good news stories we explored last week. Now, the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch and the news of the expansion of the message of Jesus beyond Jerusalem to Samaria and to Judea. And suddenly, emerging from the shadows, a sinister figure reappears. A man who first appeared in the narrative during the stoning of Stephen in Acts chapter 7, in Acts 7, 58. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. And then in Acts 1, and Saul approved of their killing him. This is like in a movie when the evil villain first appears, overseeing evil. The anti-hero is introduced. And then in Acts chapter 9, the anti-hero reappears just after the faith appears to be growing and spreading. And we see in Acts 9, 1, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Saul. Saul of Tarsus, a man at the very heart of early opposition to Jesus' teaching. He was zealous for the traditions of the Jewish faith. He was so passionate to try to destroy this new and novel belief system. He had gone from house to house. He dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. He was like a wild, ferocious beast. Now initially, Saul's work centered in Jerusalem, where the believers lived. But as the new Christian faith, known as the way, expanded, so did Paul's passion to ensure that it didn't. And so Paul appealed to the high priest and gained permission to travel to Damascus in Syria, some 220 kilometers away, to stamp out this fledgling belief in Jesus. So in just such a short time, we see how widespread this new faith has already become. Yet Saul was determined to stamp it out. And so much so, he prepared to travel to Damascus to stop it. And we see in verse 2 that it's emphatic. He was looking for prisoners. He was seething. You can almost imagine his eyes narrowing, his single-minded, passionate, almost frenzied attempt at trying to destroy this new and, in his mind, dangerous belief system. It feels a little bit like the Nazis in World War II, rounding up undesirables, chasing them door to door, banging down doors, smashing glass, rooting out every deflector to this new way. Saul was fully passionate about ending this belief. Then something changed on the road to Damascus in the land of Syria. Something changed. We read in verse 3, as he neared Damascus on his journey, Suddenly, a light from heaven flashed around him. Paul collapsed to the ground and he hears a voice. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Paul's response is natural but strange. He responds with a sense of obedience. Notice the, he addresses the unknown speaker as Lord. Who are you, Lord? Saul asks. And the voice responds, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now, it's interesting at this point that it's unlikely that Paul had ever met or even spoken with Jesus before. And Jesus was not, was not physically on earth. So how, can Paul, so how can Saul be persecuting Jesus? Well, because he was murdering and persecuting his people, his body, the people of God. So there's a sense in a, some very real way the people of God represent Jesus in the world. And Paul... Sorry, and Saul was intent on destroying them. And so any attempt to destroy God's people was an attack on Jesus himself. And also notice in this experience of God, it wasn't just Saul making up his own mind. He didn't hear a voice speak to him silently. It wasn't just a feeling that came over him. See there in verse 7. The men traveled with Saul and stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. And so Saul got up. And what did he then do? Did he say, merely say, oh, merely a flesh wound, you know, and continue with his persecution? Or did he dismiss this as unusual and just continue on his way? Well, no, he was blinded. We read in verses 8 and 9. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could not see, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. 
For three days he was blind and he did not eat or drink anything. This is a humbling experience for this young firebrand persecutor. He's been struck by something powerful, something remarkable, and so much so that he now has to be led by the hand into Damascus. And he was there for three days, unable to see, eat, or drink. The murderer Saul, who was deeply opposed to the fledgling faith, is struck by a blinding light near Damascus in Syria. And then as the narrative continues, we encounter another man and another miraculous vision. This vision occurs to a man called Ananias, a willing servant of the Lord. And it's hard to see how his vision could have been made up for or confirming his desires or his wish fulfillment because the content of this vision would have been very unexpected. Because the Lord tells him in there in 11 and 12, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. For he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Now I don't think anyone was expecting that. Ananias, like Saul, is told to get up and go and meet Saul, the persecutor. This rendezvous is to occur on Straight Street. Now, it's nice to know that street names in the ancient world were just about as unimaginative as they are today. Straight Street was an old Roman road in the middle of Damascus, and it would have been the main street of Damascus. So was this a trick, a trap? Is Saul feigning this to get access to the inner circle? Is this really the Lord speaking to him here? So hence, Ananias' concerns and scepticism in verses 13 to 14 is very sceptical. So it's very understandable. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. So Ananias was rightly concerned. Saul was a murderer and a persecutor. And it appeared well known that he was on his way to Damascus to throw believers in prison. But in this vision, the Lord speaks again to Ananias and provides one of the most unexpected, twistiest twists that has ever occurred. And we see in verses 15 and 16, But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Now I doubt Ananias would have seen this coming. In fact, I doubt Many would have seen this coming. What? Saul, the passionate persecutor of believers, the zealot Jew going from house to house, dragging Christians to prison, is to become what? The Lord's chosen vessel to proclaim my name to the Gentiles, kings and those in Israel. He is the one to preach the good news of Jesus to the world. It's incredible. Unbelievable. He might have been wondering at this point if he's on candid camera. You know, is this a joke? Where, where's, the, where's the hidden camera? So what did Ananias do? Well, he went off to meet Saul. He did as the Lord in this vision said. Now I wonder how Ananias felt walking towards Straight Street that day. Nervous? He was about to meet the great man who was leading the opposition to your belief. It's a bit like maybe meeting someone like Richard Dawkins, you know, the famed atheist, antagonistic to the message, or maybe Severus Snape from Harry Potter, the arch enemy, face to face as a so-called friend. Or perhaps he might have felt confidence in the power and the grace of God, trusting in the word that he just received. Well, Ananias, well, anyway, with Ananias, with great faith and trust, obeyed the vision of the Lord. He left and found the house and meets Saul, the great persecutor of believers. And notice the tenderness and the fraternity with which of the greeting that he gives Saul. He doesn't spit on him and say, "I know people you killed, you awful excuse of a human." He doesn't gloat, you know, no, 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 you know, look what happened to you, you know. He doesn't rub it in. He places his hands on Saul and addresses him as brother. 
Now, this is more than just brotherhood of humanity, or like in a black American greeting, yo, brother, you know, or hey, bro. It's, it's deeper than that. It's a greeting of acceptance, of realization that he was part of the family and the fraternity of God, an enemy no longer. He was one of them. Remarkably, the firebrand persecutor was now a brother in Christ. And he says in verse 17 there, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me to you so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Saul received the Holy Spirit and he was changed. Verses 18 and 19, immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. The remarkable had occurred. The great persecutor was converted. And to confirm that the old had gone and that the new had come, Saul was baptized. He could see. His eyes were opened. He was no longer blind. Not just physically blind, but also no longer spiritually blind to the truth of Jesus. In a great act of faith, Ananias meets Saul. And Saul is converted. So is this conversion genuine? Or is this an elaborate trick just to get on the inside of this new faith? A masterful plot to destroy this belief from the inside. Well, any idea that this was a fake conversion or a trick is demolished by the very first word of verse 20. Immediately or at once. Immediately after his conversion, this passionate persecutor began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. In the very synagogues he was supposed to root out opposition, he was preaching the very message he had travelled to Damascus to destroy. It's like a Ku Klux Klan member suddenly preaching the equality of the races, or like the the character Jake Sully in the movie Avatar. Um, I'm not sure if you've seen it, it's the most popular movie ever, so you might have seen it. Anyway, but he changes sides to become a part of the people of Pandora, the people he was previously opposed to and spying on. Yet he changed. Saul changed. And the reaction to this astonishing about face was expected. People were amazed, astounded, as though he'd gone mad. Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Um, something's gone wrong here, Saul. You seem to have the memo wrong here. You know, you're supposed to oppose Jesus, not pre- preach it. You're supposed to take his prisoners, his disciples prisoners, not be their friends. Saul, what's going on here? Suddenly, Saul was a formidable ally to the Christian cause. He was growing in strength and influence and baffled the Jews in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Messiah. And already Saul was fulfilling the mandate that the Lord had revealed. Ananias, he was the Lord's chosen instrument to proclaim to the world. But also the second part of the Lord's revelation to Ananias also started to come true. Because in verse 16, the Lord revealed to Ananias that the Lord will show him how much he must suffer for my name. There was irony here. For the one who previously caused suffering to those who claim the name of Jesus was now going to suffer for the very cause he had previously persecuted. And it didn't take long for the hunter to become the hunted. Verses 23 to 24. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan, and day and night they kept close to watch on the city gates in order to kill him. Life had suddenly become dangerous for Saul. His previous employers had become his opposers. He had to escape. And in a scene which wouldn't be out of place in any Hollywood movie, Saul dramatically escapes Damascus in a basket at night through an opening in the city walls. Saul then returns to Jerusalem, attempts to make contact with the disciples, yet they were rightly sceptical. But Barnabas advocates for Saul, recounting the light and Saul's direct encounter with the Lord, and Saul is accepted. And Saul then continues to preach, speak, and debate. He talked and debated with Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. 
He did this so much so that the Hellenistic Jews who had adopted the Greek culture and language tried to kill him. So in only seven verses here in the book of Acts, Saul has already had two attempts on his life. Perhaps then that the early church realized that Saul might need some protection. And so he was sent off to his home to Tarsus. And this little section closes with peace in verse 31. And the church throughout Judea, Galilee and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It increased in numbers. But Saul had changed. The church had changed. The world had changed. Saul was now a preacher, an advocate for the message he had previously opposed. So what changed in Syria? Well, a lot. We can see that Saul changed his mind. And this was far more dramatic and deep than any politician or political allegiance. Because well, Saul just didn't change his mind, but his entire worldview, his outlook, his future and his vocation. He changed from a persecutor, a murderer of Christians, to being a proclaimer, an advocate for this message. Now there are many attempted explanations for the conversion of Saul. Some dismiss it as mere fiction. Others claim he had an epileptic seizure, a mental breakdown or a psychotic break. Others have claimed he fell off his horse and hit his head and suffered concussion. But none of these explanations explain why he changed. And so immediately. These might explain why he might have seen a light or heard voices or had something knock him off his horse. But it doesn't explain how a leading opponent of the Christian message suddenly becomes its greatest defender virtually overnight. Saul had no incentive to change. There was no money, no title or power to be given for changing to promote this new belief. No, in fact, he faced precisely the opposite. Immediate suffering and death threats from those with religious power. So this demonstrates the immense power and truth of God. As Baron George Littleton wrote in a letter in the 18th century, as he reflected on the conversion of Saul, also known as Paul, that he was so convinced of the authenticity of Saul's conversion that he believed in itself to be, in itself, a demonstration sufficient to prove Christianity to be a divine revelation. Saul experienced nothing other than the power of the risen Christ. The power who can change and transform anyone, no matter how opposed to the Christian message they might be. No one is beyond the power or the reach of God. Saul's conversion in Syria is testimony to the power of God. But Saul's conversion in Syria is also a testimony to the grace of God. For what changed in Syria? Well, we see that the past is upended, overturned and forgiven. Saul's story demonstrates God's grace, enabling his past to be forgiven. I must confess I'm puzzled about why the Lord chose Saul to be his chosen instrument to proclaim his name to the Gentiles and to their kings and to the people of Israel. Ananias was not told any specific reason why Saul was chosen. It might have been because of his formidable intellect, his oratory power, his brilliant mind, his passionate nature. Could be, but we're not told. But I do wonder if it's because Saul is a man who could really understand and demonstrate grace undeserved favor which is the heart of God's message for us he was accepted by God despite his actions in the past I think it's harder for someone like myself to really appreciate the depth and majesties of God's grace I grew up in a Protestant church I was always near or around the truth I got you know, I had good family that taught me the Bible you know, I never really got into much trouble I was a good kid. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. I was and still am very much a sinner. 
at times with impure words, impure thoughts, impure personal habits, and a heart bent towards greed and material gain. But I never made massive life mistakes. I never ran away from God. I never persecuted the church. I never sought to throw believers in prison. And I never approved of the murder of Christians. Yet Saul did. He was a sinner, a murderer. And yet God chose him. This, at one level, is scandalous. But it shows the scandal of grace, of God accepting sinners despite their background. For Christianity is not churchianity. It's not about putting on your Sunday best and looking good. It's about understanding the true brokenness of humanity, our sickness. And despite our rebellion, God loves us. Saul would have understood forgiveness. He would have understood grace. He would have understood Jesus as the doctor. It's about forgiveness. And I think this is revolutionary. And I think our world really struggles to understand forgiveness and accepting people who have made mistakes. For example, a sin that's committed when we're 21, you know, it may exclude you from public office. A mistake on social media and you're hounded from power. It's a challenge to our world who cancels anyone who has sinned in the past. Indeed, the experience of Saul, who becomes the Apostle Paul, shows how the gospel helped him deal with his unpleasant past. In 1 Corinthians 15, 8 to 10, Paul wrestles with the sins of his past, his own history of shame where he persecuted the church, which he subsequently joined. But the memory of this has stayed on with him in some way. He thought he was unworthy to be called an apostle because of what he did. Yet he could still stand as an apostle, as one chosen to be an instrument to proclaim this message by the grace of God. For he writes in 1 Corinthians 5, 15, For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. In knowing his history and also knowing what he knew about God, he knew he was still qualified to speak as an apostle. There was value in knowing his history as a persecutor of the church, but that did not continue to define him. He had freedom from his past because of the grace of God through the death and resurrection of Jesus on his behalf. He could acknowledge his past, but he wouldn't be constrained to it. By the grace of God, he was what he was, forgiven, free, an instrument to proclaim this wonderful message of freedom, grace, and acceptance. Paul sinned. He murdered Christians. Yet he was redeemed, saved by Jesus. So in many ways, he's the ideal man to proclaim to the nations because he understood and experienced the great power and grace of God. So what changed in Syria? The power and the grace of God was revealed. Converting and transforming and changing a man so passionately opposed to this message so that history reveals him as the most influential preacher and teacher the world has ever known. And this power and grace of God is still at work today. For the politician I mentioned before, George Wallace, the racist segregationist, um, to the one who accepted all. Well, what changed his mind? Well, it could have been many things. But fundamental to his change about race relations was that in the late 1970s, he announced that he had become a born-again Christian. Some were sceptical, but then his actions changed. Wallace openly renounced his past support for segregation and apologised to black civil rights leaders. He confessed that he had once sought power and glory, but now realised he needed to seek love and forgiveness. He publicly asked for forgiveness from black people in Alabama and beyond. And after his conversion, Wallace served one more term as governor. 
in which, in which he made a record number of black appointments to state positions, including two, two black cabinet members for the very first time. At his funeral service, led by Franklin Graham, the son of the late Billy Graham, Graham says, As there is, and the result was that he changed and he became a man redeemed. Graham, offering a variation of his famous quote about George Wallace, said, Jesus Christ today, Jesus Christ tomorrow, Jesus Christ forever. The Christian message is fundamentally about change. Change from death to life, from darkness to light, from sin to righteousness, from apathy to love, from persecution to preaching, from selfishness to service. And I've heard countless stories of people encountering Jesus in varieties of ways, dramatic encounters in bedrooms whilst in despair, encounters in pubs in the gay quarter of Sydney, quiet realisations in a hotel room, a growing realisation through university lecture rooms, encountering the message at church every week, all encountering the power and the grace of God which leads to change. So let us remember the story of Saul. And whilst it may be unusual and dramatic and very much unlike the story of most of us, I doubt that we've ever been knocked off our horse and seen a light. But it's also the story of all believe, uh, sorry, of all who believe, a story of repentance and faith who have turned from a life away from God to being a part of the family of God. A story of change in Syria demonstrating the power of and the grace of God. So that the great villain Saul could also now instead say, Jesus Christ today, Jesus Christ tomorrow, Jesus Christ forever, for the rest of his days. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that Jesus is for all people and that in Syria on that dusty road 2,000 years ago, your power and your grace were revealed. You converted the greatest opponent of the faith and brought him forgiveness and gave him power to proclaim your name. Today, may we know afresh your power and your grace, knowing that you change people to your glory. Amen. In Galatians 1, 11 to 12, the Apostle Paul writes about his own conversion, saying, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, may we go from here encouraged and strengthened, knowing afresh your power and your grace. Please help us to always live in this grace with confidence and peace that comes from knowing that we are forgiven. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, that brings us to the end of our gathering this morning. There's, please stick around for some morning tea. I think the children, the youth, sorry, the youth are out there gathering orders. So please get your um, orders ready. They can come to bring you some food. And next week, our international tour continues as we go to the little island in the Mediterranean called Malta. So next week, we're going to be looking at Malta. What happened in Malta? And um, we'll look forward to seeing that next week as we go on it, as we continue our look at this international message. Hope you have a great week and we look forward to seeing you back here next week on our international tour.